Main to sub alignment is one of the most highly requested videos on my channel. This one is not exhaustive. We're going to be doing a series, but the reason why I think so is it's one of the last crossovers that we actually have control over in the field as audio engineers. No longer are we opening up three-way speakers and wiring our own filters to cross over these big passive boxes. Manufacturers are taking care of that for us. So now that we do have oftentimes these separate main and sub boxes, we do have to make sure they're coupling well over the space. But I do want to set this uh, solution uh, in its proper place. Is it the most important thing you should be doing on site? Absolutely not. If you have time for it, should you do it? Yes, it's worth paying attention to. And I think even diving into the subject, what I hope it does is give you a better grasp of these fundamentals of reading the magnitude and phase graph. What does things with equal level, how do they interact with each other? How can we get better at, at reading data and making good decisions with it overall? So again, that's the focus of part one today is we're going to be cracking open open sound meter and pouring in some traces and going step by step what it looks like to perform a main to sub alignment and remove the variables of the field, the microphone placement, all these other ideas. I'm excited to share this with you today. I'm going to have my OSM uh, project file available for you at the link below in my audio toolkit. So make sure and grab that. There'll be a few other links to additional resources below as well if you want to learn more about this subject. My name is Michael Curtis. I love helping everyone Every seat sound amazing and helping you do the same. Let's jump right in. First up is we're gonna set our open sound meter project up from scratch. If you're not familiar with the software, it's very similar to Smart, at least the math is under the hood, has a little bit different workflow. It's available under a pay what you want model. So go to opensoundmeter.com to grab your copy of it, start playing around with it. If you use it more, go ahead and donate to Pavel, the developer, making a cool piece of software for us. So why OS open sound meter and not Smart? I'm very familiar with that software. I really pray appreciate rational acoustics in their work, but there's a couple data manipulation features that are only available here in open sound meter uh, as of this recording when compared to smart. So I think it's really cool that we can have an environment where we can play with the data a little bit and not just capture uh, it well. So we're going to be looking at that uh, and, and walking through those features after we, we import the data, but I want to set some context as to why we're working within that software today. We need to have some data to work with, so let's gather it. So I've actually taken data from tracebook.org. It is an open source library of measurements. There's a set of guidelines that you use to capture data in a certain way. So you can see here, this is a KW-153. It's outside and it's pointed at a microphone here on the ground. And the point is to, is to capture that speaker's response in this environment when we can all share the data, you know, because QSC has published the magnitude response, but we don't have the phase data unless we import the GLL file and the GLL viewer and have to export it. So this is cool. They have something third party and we can look at all the presets and such. Uh, so this particular capture is on the normal HF um, or uh, LF management and the flat preset, I've actually downloaded the normal HF preset and I have the external sub, AKA the crossover that's built in at a hundred Hertz because I'm gonna be handing off to a sub. We of course could leave it on default or even on the deep mode, but I'm just choosing external subs since that's the most common use case with the KW-153 when pairing it up with a sub. The sub I'm choosing is the QSC KS-118. I know it marries well with the KW-153, will make a great guide for us, but I do want to look like look at its four different processing combinations apart from the cardioid stuff. We're not going to touch that today, but it has a deep mode, which extends the low frequency response. And we also can choose a crossover of 80 Hertz or hundred Hertz. And the really cool thing about it is QEC made it to where the phase response at that crossover stays constant, no matter which constant, uh, which which crossover you choose or which filter you choose, which is which is great. So it uses a little bit of DSP wizardry, wizardry to make that happen. I went to the website. I go down here to TF CSV, right click, save link as, and that gives me a .txt file. This is the same if you went into Smart and you exported it to ASCII. So I have those files and they are here now on my desktop. So I have the 153 external sub flat I have the four KS-118 files with a combination of a 80 Hertz crossover and regular response, 80 Hertz crossover in deep mode, and the same thing with 100 Hertz regular crossover 
uh, hundred hertz and deep mode. The last trace I have is my target curve. So the Michael Lawrence target cu curve that I use all the time. And you will also be able to have access to this open sound meter file for download at the link in my audio toolkit. And you can play around with this as well. And the great thing about an open sound meter project file is it carries it tra its traces with it. So you don't have to download and import these as well. You can just get this OSM file and be able to open it and see exactly what I'm seeing. So with that, we're gonna import this data into open sound meter. Let's go here. First, I want to import my KW153, command I, 153 external sub flat. We have that here. Now I'm going to import my four subs. So let's do 80 hertz regular, 80 hertz deep, 100 hertz regular, 100 hertz deep. And I'm going to also import my target curve. I'm going to be a little bit anal and recolor these. So hold on. Now that I've adjusted my colors, let's move on to defining success via our target curve and therefore adjusting the speaker processing we're going to use to get to that target curve. I've already decided that we're gonna use this for our main speaker. I'm gonna go down here to adjust gain. This is the same thing as a trace offset in Smart. I'm gonna bring it up 9 dB and get it up to my target curve. So it's just turning up the level and I'm basically making it overlay here as much as possible. I will of course do a little bit more EQ in the field to maybe adjust this, but this is a good starting point out the gate. Now I'm going to do the same with each of our subs and let's give it 10 dB, we're close, this one. And what I'm looking for is how can we make sure that these sub traces are lining up as closely as possible with the, the target trace. And so I can see if I have an 80 hertz crossover and I get rid of these at 100 hertz, there's now this giant gap here between my main and my sub if it gets them at this level. And that would mean a whole lot of coupling we need in the middle. So this automatically rules out in this particular case of just mirroring a single sub with a single KW153 uh, going with this low of a crossover. So let's get rid of those. We've decided that. Now we're going with a 100 hertz crossover. So I like to get as low of a response out of my subs as possible. I really like having that, that weight to them. So I'm gonna put it on deep mode. So now that I've decided on this particular sub matching up with this 153, we can move on to our alignment procedure. We've got four steps that we're gonna walk through when thinking about main to sub alignment. Again, this is not a field test and what to do in the field, but these are the ways I'm thinking about beforehand, how you can start experimenting with the data here in open sound meter so it can prepare you to do this in the field. So what we care about with the main to sub alignment is when these two sources are within 10 dB of each other. And this is leaning on Bob McCarthy's classic approach. If you have three zones, you have the combing, the transition, and the isolation zone. So when two sources are equal in level, that's when they're going to interact the most. So if I have a tiny little front fill speaker on top of a huge line of subs, I'm not too concerned about crossover right there because again, Bob McCarthyism, it's Godzilla versus Bambi. We don't care. But since our mains and subs are going to be equal in level at some point, that's where we care about aligning them the most. So what we're doing is using the magnitude data, aka this bottom graph, to look at where they're equal in level, and that will determine the window over which we care about them being aligned in time. Again, this uh, is something we're looking at that doesn't care about where the main and sub is going to be in space on your actual show. They could be sitting one on top of another, one could be flown, you have subs flown with their mains. I don't care about that right now. I, I just care about showing you how they marry when they are equal in level and how we can look at the phase data, aka the timing over frequency data to make sure they do couple when and where you want them to couple. So depending on their placement, that timing is gonna vary much over the space and that's up to you to decide decide how much you want to prioritize that or control it and know that you can't control it if they are separated from each other because the timing distances between the timing deltas between main and sub change so much over the space. So we've already made sure that these traces of our main and sub align closely with our target. That's 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 our first kind of prerequisite here. And now we need to define the 10 dB window because 
combing is where they're interacting and in, uh, the most with zero dB. Isolation is if they're it's within like four dB of each other. And then greater than ten dB means like yeah, we don't really care what they're doing with each other because they're not affecting each other very much. So what's an easy way to do that in this software is again we can use our tra trace offset or our gain. So if we're already at plus nine, let's increase it ten dB and see where it aligns down here. So adding 10 to nine would be 19. And now I can now look at this crossover frequency. And my cursor shows me that right here where they meet is 117 Hertz. So I'm going to put that here. You see some of my cheater notes from earlier. And let, now let's do the upper bounds. If it, we were at 9 dB, now I'm gonna decrease this 10 dB. So that would be negative one and see the lower bounds where they're gonna interact. So that would be 184. Uh, five hertz. So I've already got that written down here. So basically I care about where the phase traces, getting them to overlap between that window. That is the alignment. That's when they're most equal and level within that window. It's tempting to think, well, I, it's main to subs. I need to get the mains to overlap in the lowest frequencies possible, but we only care about where they're within that 10 dB window of each other. So that is the priority zone. I'm now gonna move this trace back to its original area. And now I wanna make a little target here in the software for us to look at. So a cool feature in Open Sound Meter is I can add a filter and I can have it apply and actually affect the traces here, but I can also use it as a little visual guide. So I'm gonna hit Command F and this is a Butterworth low pass filter, a third order. I'm gonna make it super steep, make it 10th order. And I'm gonna put it here at our upper bounds, which was 184 Hertz. And that shows me the upper bounds and the minus three dB point, since this is a Butterworth filter, is going to be right here. And now Command F, let's add another one. And our lower bounds was 117 Hertz, 117. I'm gonna make it 10th order and switch it over to a high pass filter. So now I can use my little screen brush tool and draw a, like, a, like a little window. And this is where I care where they're overlapping. At the current moment, I, I don't really care about what's going on above this window. So I can zoom in my graph to just pay attention to it. But first we need to set our timing standards. So I'll get rid of these filters now that we have our, our target area. And in the field, when you're doing this, when you're setting your delay locator to lock onto a speaker to establish a reference, unless you use a very specific feature in Smart that's able to lock onto a specific low frequency and time to that, you're gonna be using a, a, a general uh, small FFT that's able to lock onto, see impulse response spike, and then find that and align your measurement and your reference. If that was all Greek to you, <laughs> basically we're gonna use our main to be our reference point for timing. So I'm gonna use this and apply no delay to it and adjust it, it's just gonna be as is, and this is now our standard. So now given this, I'm gonna be adjusting the delay time of the sub to match with this. Again, to reiterate, these were two traces that were not taken with the speakers next to each other. They were different environments. So this is not a pre-alignment delay setting. This is just us experimenting with these traces to get them to overlap and to look at the data. So where we're going with this is in open sound meter, you can hit command M and you can do a math source. So we can look at two different sources interacting with each other and look at their predicted summation, which is pretty cool. So we have our main speaker here. We're not gonna touch it. And now I'm gonna start adjusting delay. And we have to think, okay, which way do you need to go? Do we apply negative delay, AKA move it forward in time or add delay, uh, make it late. So a phase graph, when we see a downward slope, that means we are lagging. If we see an upward slope left to right, AKA this part of the subtrace, then we are leading. And when it is flat, we are on time. So we can see that right here is in basically at 80 Hertz was where we were on time for this subtrace. So we need to make the rest of it dive down to meet the main. So I can increase it. We can see it diving down. Let's just keep going, keep diving down, keep diving down. And we want the phase slope, AKA the, ang the phase angle uh, of our crossover region to match our main. So we may not always be able to get exactly there, but we can get close. So let's just keep going. We need to keep it diving down and we're getting close here. All right, let's see. 
Nice. Okay, we're getting some overlap, but it's not perfect. Let's just play with it a little bit more once we have the math source. And I want to look at this a little bit closer. So I'm going to zoom in to 400 hertz, 400 hertz. I'm going to be bring back in my targets or my filters to look about. We just really care about them overlapping here. So I'm going to use my, again, my screen brush tool to kind of paint this target. And now I can look top to bottom and know they're like, okay, I care about my graph aligning the most within this window. So now I can play with the delay a little bit more. I'm going to go back to my sub, select it, and let's see if we can get this to line up. Again, I really care about the center part. So I'm going to add delay. Right now, 125 hertz. It's a little bit uh, on negative delay, and then it's a little bit positive delay on the upper side. And so we're basically spreading out the error across uh, the spectrum. So this is this close as good. For what, uh, this is close to what we need. You may think like, well, they're not perfectly aligned. Is everything going to fall apart? So I'm going to show you Merlin Van Veen's phase wheel. And this states that at zero degrees, basically perfectly aligned in phase, we get a perfect plus 60 dB addition. That's a, that's a doubling. But we can move all the way to 55 degrees off right here and still get 5 dB, which is pretty great. If we go back to open sound meter, so I'm going to draw a line that's basically 45 degrees long. I'm going to drag it along these traces and we see that the drifting never gets beyond that amount. So they're actually within 45 degrees of each other the entire time, which is what we want. Again, it's the relative timing of all these frequencies coming together. If we are way out of time, we get cancellation. If we get in time, we get summation. So this is where I would align them. So now let's see if this has actually worked. I'm going to go to vector sum, call it main plus sub, boom. I'm going to choose the two sources. So it's going to take X plus Y. So I'm going to take this trace, the external sub and flat, and this is it, it taking into account the gain offset and the delay offset we put in there. Then we're going to put in the deep 100 hertz, turn it on, and voila, we see our response. So we see what's predicted to happen when these two sources are together at this given setting. Let's zoom out and look at it a little bit better. But now we can see we're much closer to our target here within this like 125 hertz weighted octave, and they're now coupling together. I still might use some EQ across the inputs coming in the desk to help get it up to there and just listen and see if it really needs it. So all that being said, I can know that these speakers do work and they do couple together. I will get summation throughout that crossover and I'm able to get similar-ish phase slopes, aka less than a 50 degree offset throughout that 10 dB window, that is a success. To recap our steps, we adjusted our main and sub traces to fit in with our desired target trace. We used the main as our timing standard. It was immovable in time. We did adjust level, and then we were able to adjust the delay of our sub to match that. We already chose the processing preset to make sure uh, we have the accounted bandwidth uh, in place, but then we were able to inspect the summation zone and be able to get the, the, the phase slope within plus or minus 50 degrees throughout that 10 dB window. If we're able to do that, we, again, we, yes, we can see summation throughout the crossover region, and this is what we could do in the field. So instead of simulated data, we could do this the exact same way while we're out in the field. But there's a whole other set of questions of where do we put the microphone? What about when mains and subs are together? What about when they're separate? Those are a lot of variables. But today, I just wanted to show you how to think about these steps apart from those variables, get more comfortable with Alpen Sound Meter, show you some of its features, and how we can verify how all this data works works together. Don't forget to get the open sound meter file that you see here at the link below in my audio toolkit. Again, my name is Michael Curtis. I love helping every single seat sound amazing and helping you do the same. I appreciate you watching and I'll catch you next time.